Hello and welcome to another edition of At Issue. I'm Sue O'Connell. My colleague Matt Pritchard is on the road in New Hampshire and he's going to join us in just a few minutes. And of course, he's talking to folks about the historic case of former President Donald Trump. He's now America's first felon president after his conviction in the hush money case. We'll hear from lawmakers, legal experts and political observers on both sides of the aisle on this monumental verdict. Even with Trump's conviction, swing state polls for President Biden don't look good. And his public approval level is dropping. Some Democrats are freaking out. Two Democrats give us their view. But first, the conviction of Donald Trump. He was found guilty on 34 counts of falsifying business records in a scheme to hide his alleged affair with porn star Stormy Daniels from voters before the 2016 election. The jury of seven men and five women deliberated for just over nine and a half hours before rendering their verdict. The political ramifications of the verdict are totally unknown. We might get some sense in some polls that come out over the next few days. After the verdict was read, the Manhattan district attorney and former president spoke out. But this was a rigged decision right from day one with a conflicted judge who should have never been allowed to try this case, never. The real verdict is going to be November 5th by the people. And while this defendant may be unlike any other in American history, we arrived at this trial and ultimately today at this verdict in the same manner as every other case that comes through the courtroom doors, by following the facts and the law. Mr. Trump and his attorneys are promising an appeal. More on that in a minute. Here's what some Democratic and Republican leaders are saying about this piece of history. Put aside the partisanship for a second and just honestly say, do you want to tell your grandkids that you voted for a convicted felon to be president? of the United States, convicted of paying off a porn star. How is that aligned with American values? This isn't just ridiculous. This actually erodes the confidence that Americans have in the justice system. We're nominating a convicted felon to be president of the United States. This is not the party of law and order that Ronald Reagan would recognize. And Democrats have an opportunity here to govern to campaign, to win voters' trust on law and order issues. To me, I think that it just will, you know, cause more people to say, you know, what is this all about? I mean, what are we doing here? You know, there's so much more important issues that are affecting us, everyday Americans just, you know, trying to uh, make ends meet, and we're focusing on this. The judge set Trump's sentencing date as July 11th. That's just four days before the Republican National Convention begins in Milwaukee. None of Trump's three other criminal trials are scheduled to begin before Election Day on November 5th. My colleague and co-host Matt Pritchard joins us now from New Hampshire. Matt, former President Trump constantly used legal or political setbacks as a way to uh, mm -hmm. get more support from his MAGA movement. But... Is a criminal conviction any different than those previous setbacks? I mean, it is in the way that now he is a convicted felon. That's what it's going to list whenever anyone, any one of his critics talk about him. They're going to say that Donald Trump is a convicted felon. But for Donald Trump, as he goes towards his base, that's really a rallying cry. We've seen him do it in the past, as you mentioned, and he'll likely do the exact same with this, turning that setback into an opportunity. Many of those uh, who believe in the former president believe that this was politically mo motivated, and as a result, they're going to continue to throw their support behind behind the former president. But as we've seen in the days that have followed from this verdict, opinions are very split about how this all went together. Let's hear from a few of our Massachusetts representatives, Senator Elizabeth Warren and Amy Carnevale, the head of Mass GOP. Twelve independent people who had been signed off by on both sides, listened to all the evidence, got together and said guilty. And that is the judicial system working the way it should, whoever has been accused of a crime. They see some of these political um, prosecutions as, as a bit of a sideshow, um, that may be a distraction. Uh, they may not like it. But again, they're more interested in talking about the policies under Trump when he was president. 
So the core bases of Joe Biden and Donald Trump certainly going to stay exactly where they are. The question is, is what happens to those voters in the middle? Maybe those that were backing Nikki Haley in the primary process. Does this change anything for them? We're just going to have to wait and see as we near Election Day. So, so Matt, you're standing there in New Hampshire, which is one of the few battleground mm -hmm. or swing states coming up in this election. What, what are the folks there telling you about this case? One of my favorite things about coming up to New Hampshire, Sue, is the fact that when you come here, you're going to hear every single opinion represented. And it doesn't take long to hear them. We were walking up and down Main Street in Nashua, and within a few minutes or so, we had eight, ten people who all had a different perspective on what took place uh, with the verdict on Thursday. Take a listen to what a few of them had to say to us. I'm glad I, found, I got found guilty, but I'm going to vote for him. I'm going to plan to vote for him. Everything is good. And now that Joe Biden's president, you know, things weren't going so well as, as good as they were before. We were sitting on the back porch and our neighbor comes running out. She goes, guilty, six counts so far. And she said, we got up and ran into the house. And by the time we got in, it was up to 30. Then 30, we're like, we're like, oh, I really didn't watch it. I, I saw it on my phone that he was guilty on all counts. Yeah. But there's more to that. There's more to that story than what it appears to be. And New Hampshire is certainly a smaller state, but it will play in this particular election, which is expected to be razor thin. Every battleground state is going to matter, and we'll wait and see which way the Granite State chooses this coming November. Sue, back to you. All right, Matt Pritchard, thanks so much. Let's continue the conversation here in the studio. Joining me are Democratic activist Jaquetta Van Zant, who is host of Politics and Prosecco podcast, and Jennifer Nassour, former Republican Party chair of Massachusetts and the co-founder of the Pocketbook Project. All right, Jennifer, I know you're not a huge fan of uh, Donald Trump. You were a supporter, of course, of Nikki Haley in the primary season. What's your take on this verdict? So I, I honestly, earlier yesterday, I thought I had heard that it was a hung jury, which is what I thought it was going to be, right? And it would just be more messy, mistrial, and the whole thing. Um, I was really, I actually was very surprised that they had him, found him guilty of all 34 charges unanimously. Um, I mean, I do, you know, it, it, look, I, I don't like the guy, but I think that there are some, there are some big issues that we as Americans need to be concerned about, right? And it's having that prosecutorial pr power by someone who is clearly very political mm -hmm. going after someone else who's political. Take out the names of the characters, take out their political parties, take out your feelings on them. It smells and it doesn't feel very good because none of us would want that to happen to us. And really, at the end of the day, you know, elections should happen at the ballot box and they shouldn't be happening in this fashion. And so it, it just the whole the whole trial just didn't feel well, it t didn't feel good to me. But I think more importantly was I think a lot of people were very surprised, including Donald Trump, because Donald Trump normally, when he leaves the courtroom, you know, he's all grandeur and he's giving his speech and the excitement that that man has. I don't know where he gets it from, but I mean, he, he's able to conjure up excitement. He left yesterday. It sounded like he, he sounded like Joe Biden when Joe Biden usually gives a speech and sounds like he's at a funeral. All right, Jim, he's go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Listen. <laughs> Um, I appreciate everything that you just said, but, you know, look, as a, as a person of color in this country, this is not unusual to see someone go after and, you know, end up in a trial where some people feel like, oh, it's unfair. But I will say this, he created the path that brought him there. His arrogance, his defiance, his divisive tactics all put him in this place. You're supposed to stay out of the spotlight. And he absolutely put himself in the spotlight. So I have no sympathy. He was completely deflated. I loved it. It was just very good. I had a glass of Prosecco. <laughs> I, I have a lightning quick question for you. So should judges and prosecutors and sheriffs not be elected? Should they be appointed? So, I mean, that's the problem we have here. If, if you're mm -hmm. running as a Democrat or a Republican and you're going to go investigate a Democrat or a Republican and... I mean, we have states where judges are elected. What's the answer? In New York. I grew up in New York, and judges are elected in New York. I, and I also had a, a problem with the appointment process, right? Because if you have a Republican governor, they appoint, you know, mm -hmm. someone mm -hmm. with it, right? So, I mean, how do you get out of it? Well, I think how you get out of it is this. If you are a judge, it, you tell your family, you're not working 
for the DNC. If you're a prosecutor, you can't leave working for the DNC a year before and then become the prosecutor on the former president's case. I mean, you can't, you have to tell your family you're not donating to it's any of these causes. List, right? It's a, it, it is, but I think that there have to be better ethics around all of this yeah. to really ensure that that there isn't misconduct on the on the prosecutorial level, on the legal level. And, and this just calls into question, unfortunately, the legal system and, and the integrity of it. And that's what makes me sad is that as a lawyer, I feel like this really shows a lot of flaws here and it needs to be fixed. And this, this is something that's going to I won't go bring on. up Alito and Thomas <laughs> in this conversation, but I will say I'm but having yeah. a lot of fun conversations with a lot of Republicans who think that the justice system isn't working. And when I say, well, funny, that's what BLM was saying. And they all say, well, we're not burning down cities. And I say, well, that wasn't the BLM platform, but January 6th didn't have a fire. But I mean, what's your reaction when you hear people say the system is, is cooked? I am so over it. I'm just like, to me, it's this is something that we have lived since they brought us here. So for me, I, I, I don't think that that's a good enough excuse. The legal system is flawed. It certainly is flawed, but this is something that we have talked about when we talk about justice and equality for a long time. All of a sudden, now everybody's talking about, well, this doesn't look right or it doesn't smell right because it's Donald Trump. And I'm not saying that you're a fan of him because I know you're not, but why did it take this man to show you all that this is a, a flawed system? All right, let's talk about Nikki Haley quickly. Former President Trump has got to consolidate those Nikki Haley voters if he's going to win this election in the primaries and get those undecided. Does this verdict help him with those voters? <laughs> Crickets. Um, no, I mean, it, it doesn't. Look, th this helps. And if anyone thinks that this hurts Donald Trump, you are living under a rock. Mm -hmm. This 1,000 percent helps Donald Trump with his base. It helps Donald Trump also with people who were feeling that, you know, Joe Biden and his family isn't exactly squeaky clean either. Mm -hmm. Hillary Clinton wasn't exactly squeaky clean either. And so there might be folks that come over. Does, does this help him with the Nikki Haley voters? You know what would help him, him with Nikki Haley voters is if he would say something really nice about Nikki, if he would have all of his state chairs reach out to all of the Nikki Haley state chairs, if he would find some way to have unity instead of, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, that's right, you supported Nikki, you weren't on Trump, right? Because from the beginning, he said... You're not, if you're not with MAGA, then, you know, you're out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's been the whole thing. And let me tell you what Donald Trump needs right now. Donald Trump needs someone like Nikki Haley to be his vice president. Because, not because she wants to do it, not because any of us want her to do it, not because of, of a career in the future, but if that man actually has to go to jail, he cannot serve from jail. And, you know, our founding fathers, uh, he can serve from jail. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, Hold on. Two different ways of serving. Yes, he could be the president of the United States because our founding fathers did not think that we would ever have a convicted felon as a president of the United States, right. just as they did not think that we would have men in their late 70s and early 80s running for president of the United States. <laughs> so, but what I'm going to say is that, you know, at the end of the day, if he's in jail, he can't meet with heads of states. He can't get out there and attend dinners and conferences and meetings. And he's going to need someone strong, powerful, who knows what they're talking about and has a good head on their shoulders to actually be out there and be the president. We've got to leave that there. Jaquetta, you're going to stay with us and come back. Jennifer Nassour, thanks so much for chatting with us today. Supporters of the former president say he has a decent shot of overturning the case at appeal. So let's bring in NBC 10 legal analyst Michael Coyne. Do you see any areas where the president really has some solid ground for a legal foundation for an appeal? I think he's very limited grounds for appeal. I think his best chance is the length of time that went by from when these charges, when the actions that constituted the charges were taken and ultimate trial. But now part of that was attributed to his own Justice Department, the pressure they put on the state as well. So the fact is, I think that's his best chance, but I do not think there's a strong chance uh, on appeal. I think the trial judge really bent over backwards to try and, and drive straight down the middle here. I think Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels were extensively cross-examined. 
Uh, I think the judge gave them the appropriate amount of latitude, but a great deal of latitude. Uh, I don't think it's as strong as people are saying. Uh, you know, I always tell my students, what's the best way to win in the appeals court? Uh, you win at the trial court level. Most cases are affirmed on appeal. Uh, this may be the exception, but I just don't see the strength that some people are talking about of his chances on appeal. Michael, a strong democracy allows us to criticize our institutions, but in this particular case, do you think that the uh, the case is undermining the rule of law as critics and Trump continue to complain or support what happened? Yeah, no, I actually think it supports the rule of law. Uh, the fact is, is that a jury of our peers, really, not even his peers, uh, got together uh, we're very careful in evaluating the information before them. There was a case that could be made that they could have come back with the not guilty, uh, but they didn't. They listened to the judge's instructions. They credited the, the witnesses that he said shouldn't be credited. And at the end of the day, that's the way our system works. You know, we could look at the, a half a dozen, 10 different verdicts over the last 10 to 15 years where we would have disagreed strongly with it. But at the end of the day, you have to respect the jury's verdict and our rule of law. So uh, to me, this supports it completely. Presidents and paupers are all subject to the rule of law. And what it tells us uh, is that all of us uh, at the end of the day are going to be more equal under the law. The fact is, to me, at some point, it's a little silly. Uh, rich, white, powerful guys do pretty well in our justice system. The fact that he didn't uh, doesn't mean he's disadvantaged. The fact is, if you're poor and someone of color, you're often at a disadvantage in our legal system, neither of which applies to the former president. We appreciate your expertise. NBC 10 legal analyst Michael Coyne, thank you so much for joining us. Anytime, so. Coming up, more on the Trump verdict. Will it be helping the Democrats who are freaking out right now? Despite the 34 felony convictions, some Democrats are very concerned about President Biden's re-election campaign. We're going to speak with two Democrats next. Stay with us. Welcome back to At Issue. Look, we're focused on the presidential race and the conviction of former President Trump. Two Democratic activists are here to chat with us about it. Jaquetta Van Zant, still with us, and Joe Cayazzo. He's a Democratic strategist. Joe, what's your take on this historic criminal conviction of former President Donald Trump? The first ever, of course, we can't say it enough, of a president. Look, you know, I don't think getting indicted and convicted has bode well for any candidate for any office. I think, you know, I think, you know, uh, I think on, uh, on a much more serious note, um, nobody is above the law. That's exactly what this shows. Donald Trump has have a Donald Trump has led a career where he has skirted the rules. And I think finally, you know, he has been judged by a jury of his peers. And I think that, you know, the things you've seen go and play out over the last couple of days is exactly what's been coming for a long period of time. All right, let's turn now to President Biden. Um, some Democrats have concerns about President Biden's reelection prospects. I want to show you polls among some younger voters, uh, a voting group that has solidly been Democratic for years, and President Biden won them by double digit margins back in 2020. But recent polls here showing that Biden is struggling with those voter groups, including those from uh, this. This poll from an NPR PBS News Hour Maris poll. It shows Biden leads Trump by just four points with voters under 45 and by six with Gen Z millennials. And then when you add in those independent candidates like Robert Kennedy Jr., Cornell West, Green Party candidate Jill Stein, Trump jumps ahead of Biden among the younger voters. And look, look how strong RFK Jr. does among both voting groups. Now, Jaquetta, how worried are you about numbers like these? I'm actually not worried at all. This generation, Generation Z, they, they love outliers. So they like to be the person who's rooting on the other side, no matter what the issue is. So I'm not really worried about this. I think as we get closer to the election, you're going to see these numbers kind of pop up as real issues are starting to be focused on, like abortion. They're going to have to talk about Gaza. And a lot of these independent candidates haven't done that yet, and they haven't done it with any kind of real rigor. So I think you'll see the numbers change. Joe, what's your reaction? Look, you know, I think that, you know, 
pulls our snapshot in time. And I think today this is a pretty accurate look at to where people are. But I think at the end of the day, after the campaign has actually happened in just, voters will be faced with the reality that this is a binary choice. There is President Biden, who has gone to the mat for the working people of this country day, uh, day in and day out, and there is Donald Trump, who has done nothing but work hard to make his incredibly rich friends even richer. And I think that's an argument that is going to play over and over again to the working people of this country and to young folks. Look, you know, make no question about it. Times are tough in terms of inflation, but great news earlier this week, right? Uh, core, you know, the, uh, the core inflation numbers are down 60% from their peak. Right. Things are moving in the right way. We definitely fully acknowledge that things are tough out there, but things are getting better. And there is certainly a plan by the Biden administration to continue to make things better. In the two year period where Democrats controlled both chambers and the White House, they passed monumental legislation that was chiefly focused on improving the lives of people. When Donald Trump and the Republicans controlled the Congress for two years, can't say the same happened. Yeah, so, but the issue is the communication coming from the White House. The problem is not that these things don't exist, because he has done a great job. They're not communicating them out to that certain demographic. Well, Look, to that know. point, I want to pivot off that and talk about black voters, where we're seeing, you know, obviously the polls, it's still early yet, but we're seeing that former President Trump is making some inroads in that segment of the voting population, especially some black voters and black men who voted for Biden at 86% in 2020. Now, the Biden team tells NBC News that they're working to keep those voters. Jax, how are they doing, like in a state like Georgia, keeping those voters to vote for Joe Biden in November? I think it's going to be really important for the Biden administration to bring in surrogates who can talk to black men about issues that matter to black men. Black women outvote everybody. So having us in the fold and talking to black men is not going to help. They need so what are the issues for black men that separate I, them from the issues? I think for the black economy women? is the first thing. You know, numbers are down. And what they see, what black men see is, you know, unemployment is high. Am I going to lose my job? The, the COVID really hit communities of color really hard. And some of them have not really recovered from that. And so they're going to want to talk about the economy. They're going to want to talk about policing, which is super important, um, especially as we get into more conversations around police brutality and police accountability. So they're going to have to have people and surrogates in those areas that are going to talk about those issues that matter to them. Joe, what would you be advising the Biden campaign to do? Numbers don't lie. Over 15 million jobs have been created since Biden took office. He has worked incredibly hard to cap the cost of prescription drugs to make sure that more people have as much access as they need to quality and affordable health care. Those are astronomical feats by somebody who, who has been the president with the Congress who is not willing to work with him for the back half of his time, uh, you know, of his time serving. I, th I think that the more you focus on the numbers, they tell an incredibly strong story. And if I was advising the Biden campaign, it would be stick to the numbers. All right. So let as we wrap up with you two today, what what are you taking at issue? What's an issue that you're taking up? I'm taking up this issue of government accountability when it comes to behavior. I am so sick and tired of seeing our Congress act like children and do this back and forth with each other. We clearly see with our former president, now convicted felon, uh, Donald Trump, that his behavior has trickled down into Congress and people are behaving badly. I'm taking issue. I do not find it amusing. I don't find it entertaining. I am really, I'm heartbroken that this is the state of our Congress. Joe, what are you taking issue with? I take an enormous issue with the belief that our best days are behind us. America's best days lie ahead. That is because Democrats are going to hold the White House, win the Senate, and win the House. That is going to let meaningful legislation passed that is going to positively go and impact the lives of people from coast to coast. All right, Jaquetta Van Zandt, Joe Cayazzo, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate you being here. All right, that's it for this edition of At Issue. Join us next Sunday when State Auditor Diana DiZoglio will join us and maybe sing to talk about a number of issues, including her fight to audit the state legislature. Thanks for joining us. For Matt Pritchard, I'm Sue O'Connell. Enjoy the day. Thank you.